All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Oklahoma Department of Commerce monthly call on this very blustery, wintry day. I'm Jennifer Springer. I'll be your host today, and we've got a great agenda on tap. Just a reminder uh, to stay on mute. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat box and we will get to as many of the questions as we can towards the end of the call. For today, our agenda includes uh, opening remarks by Director Kissling, and then we'll have our speaker, Don Morris, speak to us about workforce. Then we'll move over to talk with General Wright uh, to give an update on the legislative session. And then we'll have an update from our Director in Community Development, Marshall Votes. So first, on the business development side, to close out last year, the Commerce Business Team reported historically high numbers. Our team achieved the investment and jobs goals that were set by our secretary, Secretary Mueller, uh, reporting 64 wins resulting in 7,849 new jobs and over $2 billion in, of investment. And so those 64 wins are projects Commerce directly uh, worked and could make an impact on. But if we look a little bit deeper into our numbers uh, by sector, if you consider our wins by sector, uh, automotive projects accounted for 13% of our wins and aerospace accounted for 17% of our wins. And so aerospace companies, uh, we actively recruit and always have high numbers, but you can see from this that the automotive industry, we're having a lot uh, of projects and we're being successful in landing those types of projects. If you consider foreign direct investment, 16% of our wins came from international companies that we recruited to Oklahoma. And then 9% of our wins were recruited from the state of California. And as you know, earlier Commerce had deployed uh, a marketing campaign in the state targeting businesses to relocate them uh, to Oklahoma. If you look at the geography of wins for the state, 48% uh, located in rural communities. So this attributed to 3,498 new jobs locating in rural communities around the state. And then one of the, the most interesting numbers uh, that we saw last year, 313 projects came into commerce uh, for the entire calendar year. Uh, that is very high. Usually we average around 160, 170, uh, right in there. So we had a very high uh, inflow of projects that came in. Uh, and then also, and lastly, uh, 396 companies is what the business team assisted last year uh, around the state. And we average around 170. So a lot of companies needing uh, resources and support. Uh, and so we were able to provide that. Looking forward at 2022, uh, the business development team has four main uh, initiatives that we're focusing on. And so first is infrastructure and site development. And so working with our communities to develop and catalog uh, industrial sites around the state to make, make sure we're meeting the project trends. Uh, so looking at our pipeline, seeing the types of companies uh, and projects that are looking at the state and making sure that we have those sites that can support them. And so we applied for an EDA grant and then a press release will go out today that we've been able to award 28 uh, communities to help them develop out their sites. Lead generation and, and pipeline build is one of our other initiatives. And so for 2022, Secretary Mueller set a very ambitious goal of 8,000 new jobs and $1.5 billion in new investment. And so we are doing, uh, making lots of efforts to make sure that we fill our pipeline uh, with new leads and we are meeting with companies uh, to generate new projects coming into the state. The Oklahoma Supply Chain Initiative is very important, helping our businesses uh, make sure they have the tools and support they need uh, to mitigate the supply chain issues that we've been having uh, and help us build robust clusters that we can recruit on the other side and bring companies to to establish around those. Uh, and we will hear from our partners at Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance a little bit later uh, in this call, but we've got over 400 manufacturers on our platform. And we're also uh, working on a business retention and expansion survey so that we can pull and better understand the needs of the companies in our state. And then lastly, talent recruitment. 
with historically low unemployment rates, uh, focusing on talent recruitment and upskilling uh, to be able to meet uh, the demands of the jobs that are coming from the projects that we recruit. So those are the priorities for 2022 for us. We have a very robust pipeline. Currently 89 projects are being worked on the business development team, uh, which is a very full pipeline for us. And so uh, looking forward to this year and already very deep into uh, the recruiting efforts. And so with that, I'm going to send it over to Director Kissling for opening remarks this morning. All right, thank you, Jennifer. You're doing a great job over in business development, and so good to see everybody uh, on today. I am actually in Enid, and if you're in southern part of the state and thinking, "Oh, is it going to storm anytime?" We are completely covered up in snow already up here, so uh, we are trying to blow it your way. Um, yeah, it's good to, good to see Mark Funky today. Looking good. Um, Good, good group. Uh, I'm going to be very brief because we've got lots of other things that uh, are much more important than me to discuss, but I uh, um, just wanted to make everybody aware uh, this coming Monday is whenever legislative session will start. Uh, Brent Wright is going to talk about that here in just a moment. The state of the state will be at noon that day. Uh, I'm anticipating that uh, most of the discussion at the state of the state is going to revolve around the, the governor's priorities of infrastructure, education, healthcare, and the economy. And of course, we're working a lot on the, the part of the speech and the part of the uh, um, portfolio of, of bills for this year that would affect the economy side of things. The general will go through that here in just a moment. Uh, but I wanted to let you all know also that uh, we are constantly looking at the numbers and, and what you are doing in the way of uh, helping to grow our economy and, and create this environment for growth. Um, it's working. Uh, right now we're at 2.3% unemployment rate. That is third in the nation, which means our employers are doing a better job of keeping our citizens employed than 47 other states are right now. It also means that we don't have just a whole lot of folks sitting around on a couch collecting an unemployment check. Um, we, uh, uh, we actually have a higher uh, labor force participation rate than we did pre-COVID and uh, uh, our, our folks are back to work. Um, we also, and Don may go into this in just a moment, but uh, our labor force is as big as it's ever been uh, in the state. But the, the really cool number that we've seen lately is that not only are our folks working, but we're attracting a lot of folks from other states to Oklahoma right now. Uh, we are uh, 11th in the nation right now in net migration. So that would be of uh, people that are moving from state to state. Uh, we are 11th in the nation in uh, collecting those folks. Uh, number one on that list is Florida, uh, 263,000 people. This is since the beginning of COVID, so this would be April, 2020. Florida is number one, Texas number two, Arizona number three, and then North Carolina and South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Idaho, Utah, Nevada, and then Oklahoma comes in at 11th. That is, uh, that's huge for us. And that's not percentage growth, that is total number of people uh, that have moved to the state as compared to other states. And in case you're interested, the bottom of that list is uh, by a long ways California and New York would be second on losing population. Illinois would be third, Massachusetts fourth, New Jersey fifth, Louisiana sixth, and, and so on. So we're doing well. Um, people uh, people want to be a part of what we got going on here. So uh, when the, the one other thing I might mention is... Uh, uh, in an effort to try to encourage more young people to get involved in the economic development industry, uh, for the first time, at least in a long time, we are doing an in, a summer internship program at the Department of Commerce. We're going to be hiring three summer interns, uh, one from OU, one from OSU, and one from any other college within the state. Um, those applications went live, I think, today or yesterday. And uh, we'll close here in the next couple of weeks. So if you know of a college student that would be interested in a summer internship at the Department of Commerce and learn how this works, uh, we'd love to interact with them. Um, but probably the biggest question that we've been getting lately is about workforce and how do you find resumes? What are the, the programs on the state level that assist in this effort? And so we have on today our state workforce director, Mr. Don Morris, and he's gonna share a little bit about what's going on in the workforce office. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, it's a great day to be on Zoom versus outside if you're 
if you're anywhere from the middle of the state left. And so, uh, so far, is, is there a way I can share my screen? Is there anybody on that could, looks like I can. Okay, thank you. Can anyone see that? Okay, can you see me now? All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, good morning again, everyone. And uh, it's, it's a great day to talk about workforce. It's fun that it's such a uh, hot topic right now. And, and uh, to meet those demands, the Department of Commerce and our office, uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, to make sure that we keep up with that. And so I, I wanna cover a few things today, starting kind of broadly, generally, and, and down to a finer point. But just know in these slides, there's a lot of information and my plan is to get these slides to you as soon as we're, we're finished talking. So if I don't cover something, uh, send me an email or, or I'll send you these slides as well. And I've embedded some, some more links for you. Um, and so the, the workforce development is a, is a mission that's about connection, right? So uh, business, education, the community need to work together in order to have a workforce talent pipeline that'll help the economy continue to thrive uh, with all the great numbers that Jennifer and, and Brent just shared with us. Um, the word development implies two things, time and change. And so when you think about workforce development, think about the long game. How do, how do we build today for tomorrow? And, and that's really the, the core to uh, workforce development. Um, here's a current picture of all the American job centers around the state uh, that you can see. Um, one minor change to this, if you look up in the northeast corner, we have combined um, what was the Tulsa workforce area and the eastern workforce development area. Those are now one area called Green Country Workforce. And so they're just, they're getting off the ground. In fact, finished some more training for some of their locally elected officials yesterday. And so that's, that is what we look like as of today in terms of where people and businesses can access the services. Um, we talk about WIOA honestly as little as possible because WIOA is not our mission. The state's economy and the people of Oklahoma, that is our mission. Um, but as we talk about workforce services under WIO, it's important that we view the entire system picture. And so it takes several partners working closely together to make development a reality. Um, our office, uh, which is Oklahoma Office of Workforce Development, OESC, Career Tech, DRS, uh, each have a piece of the WIOA grant funds and carry out a critical portion of the mission. Um, while these important duties fall under these larger agencies with much more complex missions, Local workforce boards oversee the services that you see listed here, and those are assigned to these different agencies. And that's, that's how we all work together as core partners under the grant uh, funding that we have. So uh, the question I hear the most is, so what does, what do workforce services do? Like, well, what do you people do over there? Um, and this comes partially due to our inability to fund, you know, large marketing campaigns and that sort of thing. And so my hope today is that we can answer that question for everyone from three perspectives. What do we do for the state? What do we do for people looking for jobs, job seekers? And what do we do for businesses, which I'll spend the most emphasis on uh, given this audience? Um, this slide shows statewide efforts. You'll see sector partnership strategies, I think mentioned at least three times in the next couple of minutes. So uh, we, will, we will break that down kind of as we go. Um, the, uh, serving as staff to the governor's council. The, the governor's council is a group of, of uh, business leaders primarily, 51% business leaders appointed by the governor and then other key agencies and partners that work together to serve as the state board uh, for workforce uh, development services. Um, we set policy, uh, we monitor funds across the state and how they're being spent to make sure that those are being maximized. Uh, we develop and maintain partnerships with 17 workforce partner agencies across the state, meaning training, technical assistance. Uh, we fund state level initiatives that I'll talk about momentarily as well. When it's important that workforce services focus on what is essentially two sides of the same coin. Uh, people need jobs and employers need people, qualified people. So this slide lists only a few of the key services that we provide to job seekers in Oklahoma. 
adult dislocated worker and youth programs. Those are all uh, managed through our office and carried out by local boards. Obviously, unemployment benefits are OESC, adult basic ed, English as second language. Those are career tech benefits. Connection to other benefits. The point here is that any job seeker coming to any of our workforce centers, contacting us electronically, however, however they engage us, um, we can also connect them to any other needed state benefit. A big part of our job is removing barriers that people may have to getting back in the workplace successfully. And so we can serve as any other connection. And we do work closely with DHS in terms of people needing TANF and SNAP and that sort of thing. Uh, we provide soft skills training. Actually, it's an old term. We now use the term human skills training, um, helping people build and create their resume, uh, learn how to interview. We have specific services for veterans, uh, disability services, supportive services involved. Uh, uh, there, there are situations, circumstances where we can help people with rent, uh, child care issues, steel toe boots, uh, nursing uniform, whatever it is that, that they're trying to do. We can remove those small barriers uh, with our funding to make sure that they're successful. And then we, on the job seeker side, we prioritize uh, paid work experience, meaning internships, as uh, Brent mentioned, we're, we're in that business as well this summer, which is awesome. And then uh, apprenticeship programs as well, which I'll mention. Okay, getting down to the moment we've, we were all attending about, what do we do? What does workforce services do for business and employers? I think some of what you might see here uh, might be surprising. Most people tell me that they weren't aware um, that, uh, that we do some of these things. And so you see sector partnerships listed again here. A, a sector partnership is essentially a way for uh, multiple business leaders in a common geographic area and industry who day-to-day -day would compete, but, but it's an opportunity to set those, that competition aside and look at the bigger picture of how do we work together to create a talent pipeline that keeps Oklahoma thriving, that keeps this type of employee with this skill set coming into the state. It's, it's literally a tide that rises all the boats. And so we, we fund and set up these sector partnerships. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about how we make those happen and the ones that are going on today. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, mention a few of those as well. Uh, layoff aversion and incumbent worker training funds. The, the pandemic really displays a key thing that we do, that we can and need to do more of, which is helping an employer or business uh, adapt to the environment. And so if you're in a situation where you're, you're considering having to lay off workers due to uh, less retail, less production, whatever your business is, uh, consider contacting our workforce agencies and figure out whether or not we might be able to upskill or reskill your staff. We saw a lot of people during the pandemic literally adapt. You know, suddenly your, your business is producing hand sanitizer, right? And masks and other things. Um, we, can, we can help fund those training, the training to help your employees meet those needs. And so uh, that's one of the services that we offer. Way underutilized and we can do a lot more of that uh, as well. Um, apprenticeship programs, we set a goal. Um, Secretary Mueller set a goal as a cabinet goal to increase apprenticeship programs by 30%, and that was back in June. Uh, to date, we've increased the number of apprentices in the state by about 200%. And so apprenticeship programs, and you'll see some of the investments that we've made in those, they're hot. I mean, if you don't have an apprenticeship program, you're just not in the cool crowd right now. So if you want to consider those, that's what we do. We help you set those up, and I'll share uh, some stats about that in a minute as well. Um, business services funding. And so we, in order to assist our local areas and making sure that they're connecting to business well, we have uh, allotted additional funding to each local area to pay at least one FTE to live in this space. And so all of our six local workforce areas have at least one, some of our largers, obviously like CoWeb and Green Country, will have more in that space. Uh, but at least one person whose job it is to connect with you and make sure you understand all of these services. Um, so some of these things, English as a second language and special population, we mentioned those on the job seeker side. Obviously, it benefits the employer as well to have those uh, services. And then labor market data is, is another really un underutilized tool 
that we have uh, in our office. Uh, LMI comes out of the uh, OESC shop as well. And then John Chappie's team in commerce. We all pull from essentially the same data. And so we check with each other if you ask for a number and we, we, uh, we uh, make sure that we pass those things on to you. It's, it can be a big help in the decision-making process as well. Um, so here's another big question I always get, where does all this money go? And so let me, just a very quick breakdown. I provided a visual here, um, but my hope is that this kind of sticks in your brain when you see it. Here's the workforce dollar. I've replaced uh, George Washington with a picture of WIOA because that is where this dollar comes from. Uh, no, no, uh, you know, diss on George. But 85% of our funds go directly to local workforce development boards. Those funds by formula are, are allocated literally by county, but there, there's, a, there's a formula that uh, decides how much money goes where. And it's, it's based on, the, on needs. These workforce centers and the, and the workforce development boards and local leadership, they're the boots on the ground. They're where the rubber meets the road. They're managing the cases. If you, if you could pause, if you could take a snapshot pause today of the workforce system, you'll see thousands of people at some point in a process of going from where they're at now to the successful person that you're looking to hire. And so um, some of those folks are just as involved. Some are not. Some were straight A students that dropped out of school. And there's, there's every kind of issue. And our case managers are so key to driving the machine of, uh, of workforce. This red, the term discretionary spending is a little bit, little misleading in the world of WIOA. And so discretionary uh, under the guise of WIOA. And so it's not completely discretionary, but these are the funds that we use to provide state level strategies, uh, vision from the governor through the governor's council carried out by our team and ultimately uh, completed at the local level. Just to, here's just a snapshot of what some of these dollars have done in 2021. In the sector partnership world, in 2021, we invested a half a million dollars. We created five sector partnerships at $100,000 each, uh, doing a variety of things from developing CDL truckers, the film industry. Um, I think I saw Matthew Weaver on here uh, with ACOG, working on the battery power um, staffing for the future, that sort of thing. I put an asterisk next to that because we're already approved in the process of doubling that for 2022. And so this will be a million dollar investment in 2022. This is where workforce, business and individuals meet. And so the job of a sector partnership is to combine education, the community, that little graphic I had at the beginning, the community education uh, business into one place and solve this problem with business leadership, EDOs and local economic leadership, not state agencies as, as smart as we all know that we are here in Oklahoma City. You know better what's needed in your area and how to get that done. That's what sector partnerships are. And so you'll hear more about that. We're actually putting together some meetings, I think a couple different meetings across the state to talk about that application process. It'll be extremely competitive. Uh, last year we had 21 applications to award five. And these five were awarded by the governor's council. And so these are deeply reviewed and you'll hear more about that uh, uh, as, as time goes on in the near future. So we're, we're targeting April or so to, to award those uh, grants. Apprenticeship programs, <clears throat> there's, the stats show the effectiveness of apprenticeship programs. One of those being $1.40, this is a national number, $1.47 ROI on the dollar for apprenticeship programs. If you can imagine taking down your recruiting costs taking down some other costs of retention. That's where that money comes from. And then 91% uh, uh, higher rate. And so by the time you have that right person, uh, they know your business, they know they wanna work there and you know that you wanna keep them. And so apprenticeship programs are earn while you learn, uh, you know, actual uh, work-based learning opportunity for people and also for you to sort of test drive that person. We invested $3 million in those programs uh, in 2021, and we will continue to, um, to make that investment. Uh, business services in general, this is the amount that I, I mentioned that we funded for local areas to hire additional staff 
to um, to be your business services partner. Uh, and so that's where those dollars come from. This is a small portion of what we do, but I wanted to highlight those things. And then other expenditures like incumbent worker training, the skillful talent series, every local area now is teaching classes to help businesses hire right and retain people. Um, a rapid response obviously is a big need. Uh, I, I've got a big ask in that area for art funds, so I won't reveal that just yet. Hopefully next time we all meet, I'll show you some cool pictures of our next, our next big thing that's gonna make a big difference in the state. Um, so an, the third question that I get all the time is can I do fill in the blank? I want to um, assure you that sometimes it feels like our staff in particular are always saying no. And so uh, I assure you that our mission is to do anything within the limits of our grant to make it happen for Oklahoma's people and economy. So um, these are some of the things that we are restricted from doing because we operate under one federal grant. And I'll try to walk through those very quickly. Recruiting staff for business. And so people will call me and say, hey, I need five welders and I need them yesterday. Um, we couldn't agree more. We can look in our pipeline and see where we have welders training, but we don't have, we don't serve as a staffing agency, for, for example, and we, we don't have people ready to go. I know that's an expectation that a lot of businesses have um, to call us and say, hey, I need uh, this and that. Now that is a good call and a good question, but our answer is going to be one of development. How do we start building that to where in down the road, you're not asking these same questions. Um, recruit business to the state. I want to clarify that as well. Um, and Jennifer and I had a good meeting about this the other day. How do we, we can, we can and really should be your partner when you're recruiting a business or, or, or growing a business, because we can answer the questions about our workforce through the data that we have, and then also what's in the pipeline building our workforce for the future. It's a constantly moving machine. Um, but we can't ourselves go and recruit business. You know, hey, can you go talk to this business and have them come? That's outside the limits of our of our grant. Um, market and advertise. I put an asterisk there because you don't see large campaigns. And let, let me kind of explain this. This under this is in the um, area in the federal viewpoint. This would be in the area of Tanf and Snap, for example. You don't see billboards that say, hey, you know, turn right here for food stamps, you know, that sort of thing. And so that's how it's viewed federally. And so we don't have uh, federally funded marketing campaigns and big billboards and that sort of thing. That being said, please check out all of our social presence. We're in everything um, that every teenager knows about um, where you can connect socially. And so our presence on Facebook, we got several videos on YouTube about businesses that have had success with uh, apprenticeship programs and other things. Uh, we have a huge social media presence and we do as much television and radio and those kind of spots as we can also to get the word out that these services are available to businesses and to people. Um, we can, this directly funding business startup or growth, this, this question is, is so logical because it does seem like uh, our our office would fund that thing that you're doing that will create more jobs. That makes sense. But that is where commerce comes in with the economic development side. That's exactly how we partner. And so no, our funds can't go to help any certain business. Although, as I've described, uh, our funds can help uh, multiple businesses at once um, work together. We can't directly pay staff salaries. Although, um, you know, people will say, well, I'll, I'll hire this many people if you'll pay them. That being said, we do have incentives in place under our apprenticeship program that will um, incentivize you to start a new apprenticeship program and pay half of the first six months of salary. We're not directly paying, though, that person's employed by the employer or through one of our agreements with staffing agencies to employ that person. And then just any other thing that um, is prescribed by the act that we just can't do. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that, that logic would dictate workforce dollars should be geared toward. And many of these can't do's are, are being considered as part of a revision of the WIOA Act. In fact, uh, Governor Stitt, in partnership with the Western Governors Association this year, this past year, 
uh, we're able to add some comments and concerns to be considered in the revision. But the point that I want to make is that uh, with uh, workforce services, including all the partner agencies and all the people that I've listed here, we understand what your mission is and we have your back. And just know if we have to say, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Just know we truly are sorry. We can't do that because we want to do everything we can to help Oklahoma thrive, Oklahoma business thrive, and Oklahoma people thrive. And so that's what we're here for. And finally, I've, I've put together a slide here of just a few uh, contacts, state and locally, that you can make. I encourage you, if you have a question about anything I've talked about today, reach out to the local boards uh, in your area. If, if uh, they don't have the answer, we stay in connection with them and meet very frequently. Uh, we made a lot of uh, headway in the last couple of years building partnerships with the local area so we can answer any of your questions. And then on the state side, I also included DRS, OESC, and Career Tech and some of the services that they provide. And so thanks again for letting me uh, come and jabber on about workforce services. I hope there's something in here uh, that is, is of value to you and that we can partner uh, deeper and deeper as we go to make uh, Oklahoma numbers keep going upward like we uh, have already heard about today. Thank you, Don. We've got a couple questions that have come in uh, while, while you're on here. Yeah. So first, uh, when will the next round of grants be released and is it a million dollars this round? It'll be a, it'll be a million dollar spend in total. And so there are some key questions that we still have not answered. So we're going to get those answered and set all the rules and then hope to have those rolled out by the end of April or so. Okay. And you, you may not know the answer. So the second part of the question was, will there be two levels of funding this round one for new planning grants and one for entities that were successful with the first round and need a larger funding amount to implement? That, that is exactly what I was referring to of questions we need to answer. You know, the, the way to look at that um, also, you know, do we do we do 10 $100,000 grants or do we double that amount for the next time and do five, 200? And then we've got so much momentum going with the five that we awarded this year. Uh, should some of that funding go there? Those are all the questions um, in a meeting that are hopefully gonna get answered tomorrow. And then we'll start rolling that stuff out. We're so excited about it. Believe me, you'll know when it happens. All right. And then we've got another question. Are there any resources available to teach reading skills to English speaking adults? Absolutely. Uh, Career Tech uh, has that funding through our grant. Um, you can connect directly through Career Tech and some of the things that I gave, but that ESL, English as a Second Language, is very key to driving the workforce. And just so you know, it's not just for people who aren't employed. This is a benefit that you can use as an employer to help drive your current workforce. And so those are out there. Those services are largely free to individuals and to businesses paid for under our grant. And so, yes, absolutely. The more um, literacy uh, in language and also financial literacy that we can drive, the stronger we get. All right, and that's the questions that I have on the workforce presentation. Any final remarks, Don, before we move to our next speaker? Uh, no, I just, I just hope uh, that this increases our traffic and helps us partner deeper with business and, uh, and flex the uh, Oklahoma muscle and keep driving us forward. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll go over to General Wright to give a legislative update. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, the upcoming session is the second session of the uh, 58th legislature. As Brent mentioned, the session will start off with the governor's state of the state address this next Monday at uh, noon in a joint session with the uh, House and Senate. Uh, legislators have filed over 3,000 new bill uh, and joint resolution requests. Almost 1,250 in the Senate with bills and resolution and additional 2,500 bills that we're tracking from uh, last session carried over from uh, 2021. The, the uh, Senate has had a significant change in leadership roles upon uh, Kim David announcing that uh, she would step down to pursue a statewide office. Senator Greg McCourtney was named floor leader. What does this mean? This change has meant new rules to consider legislation um, to include the timing of committee work, which will actually begin the first week of session. I was talking to Chairman Lee Wright, and he has already has a uh, committee uh, 
scheduled for next Thursday to consider legislation. So we're going to be off and running the first week uh, with committee work. Just to give everybody a heads up to uh, if they have some uh, government relations folks they want to reach out to. So Congress's priorities uh, remain uh, to increase the governor's quick action closing fund, uh, to have a significant marketing budget to attract new talent and businesses to our state, and our incentive legislation. We're working with our partners to review and track at least uh, 60 pieces of new economic development legislation, mostly focusing on workforce as well as uh, incentives. And the workforce piece I won't go into other than uh, they're trying to uh, remove barriers to entry into the workforce, uh, increase uh, the ability to get licensing. And um, so we're going to be uh, tracking a lot of legislation with our partners and look forward to uh, a busy session, I believe. So. With that, I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. All right, thank you, General Wright. Uh, next, let's go over to community development with Marshall Votes, Director of Votes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Jennifer. I'll just have a few quick updates. As I've mentioned in previous meetings, we still have uh, COVID relief dollars pretty significantly, and they're coming down in waves. Um, our most flexible funding through community action uh, still has a significant amount of funding left, but our community action partners are are spending it quite rapidly in time for the September 30th expiration date. But they um they are open to partnerships. If if you or your organization are serving low to moderate income families or neighborhoods or individuals, certainly reach out to your local community action agency for a potential coordination of efforts. Uh, in CDBG COVID relief, that one is, still has a couple of years left, which is great uh, because there's plenty of resources still left unutilized and unobligated in, in that pot of funding. And both CSBG and CDBG COVID relief can also be used for workforce development. So a lot of the things that Don was mentioning um, dovetail very nicely with your local community action agency and or your local city, town, and county both CSBG and CDBG can be used for those, those workforce development efforts as long as there is a COVID relief tieback. So anyone who lost hours, lost a career, lost a job opportunity uh, because of the pandemic, we can put resources behind their efforts to get back into the workforce and upskilled in any way. In regular CDBG news, non-COVID relief, we have we have posted the 2022 applications to the okcommerce.gov website in the community development dropdown tab. We are technically still waiting on approval for, of, of funding from HUD, but we, we have the applications out. You are welcome to um, uh, start filling out, filling out applications for regular CDBG funding. And we typically fund from last year's money for this year's projects. So even if HUD is late on funding this year, we won't delay the application approval process. Uh, on that note, there is, there is a continuing resolution for the federal budget. Many of you are aware that, that it goes until February 18th. So at February 18th, it will either expire without an agreement and the government will shut down, or most likely there will be an extension or a continuation of that funding agreement. So keep an eye on February 18th of the federal government because it will impact federally funded programs. Um, in a, a note on the regular CDBG program, as I've reported in the past, we have increased and expanded the dollar size limit of, of our CDBG projects. We are looking to fund larger, more economically impactful projects. So uh, that, that was pretty welcome news among most of our stakeholders, um, with, especially with construction costs going up. Uh, we are interested in, in providing as many resources to the funded projects as possible. So in short, there is still a lot of funding left for both community services and infrastructure development, but a significant amount of it disappears on September 30th of this year. But we always, uh, we're always open to inquiries, questions, ideas, and applications. Let us know if there's something that the community development staff can support you on and uh, reach out to my office and we're happy to help. Jennifer? All right, 
Thank you, Marshall. Next, uh, Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance, who have partnered uh, here with Department of Commerce's business team to help us uh, mitigate the issues that our businesses are having in the state when it comes to supply chain. Uh, and we have had our statewide uh, launch of the Connects platform. So I'll go over to Kenny Tilly to give us an update on the supply chain initiative. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. I appreciate it. I just want to touch briefly on something that Don talked about earlier, and that's our apprenticeship program. I can't underscore how important those opportunities are for companies. If you are not using one, we would love to get you connected with that. We do have an internal in, uh, apprenticeship program. We're working with Department of Labor and the Workforce Boards to put up $4,000 uh, into e for critical occupations such as your welder. Dr. Sharon Harrison of our team can help assist you with that if you want to launch that within your company. Uh, that being said, it's dollars per apprentice, as well as uh, $12,000 uh, per occupation. So if you are interested in that, let us know. We are working currently with 28 companies across the state. Uh, I do want to give you just one quick update as well on the OIEP program. Uh, our friends at the Finance Authority, as well as Department of Commerce, are going to be launching that again this spring. This is an outstanding program, and our field staff will be available to help manufacturers fill out those applications and get them turned in on time. And I know that the folks at Commerce and Finance Authority will be talking more about that soon as it continues to move towards the portal opening on that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to pitch it over to Michelle Ondak, who can update you on our Oklahoma Supply Chain Initiative and the Connects platform. Thank you so much, Kenny. I appreciate it. Yes, uh, updating you on the Connects Oklahoma platform that is provided in partnership with the Oklahoma Department of Commerce, Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance, and recently the Oklahoma Center for the Advancement of Science and Technology. Uh, we have currently over 500 users from across, as Jennifer mentioned, over 400 companies that have claimed their profiles in the Connects platform. We're still sitting at about only 22% of those companies have uploaded their capability statement. As a reminder, those capability statements are not only a great marketing piece for your company to have ready to go on what your capabilities and services and material specialties are, um, but they help you be found in the search results in the Connects platform. We are happy to help you put one together. If you don't have one ready, we have a free template. You can just fill in your information that I am happy to provide to you. Uh, feel free to reach me anytime at connects at okalliance.com. Uh, and if you have not yet claimed your free account on the Connects platform, you can find information on how to claim your account on the Oklahoma uh, Manufacturing Alliance website, okalliance.com forward slash connects dash Oklahoma. Uh, there are now six states that have partnered to bring a state instance of the Connects marketplace to their manufacturers, Utah, Florida, Kansas, Missouri, Michigan, and Oklahoma. We were the third one of those states to join and continue to work with new states as they onboard to help lead the way in connecting manufacturers with each other as suppliers across the nation. We were recognized uh, recently by the Connects Marketplace as the top center of those states for Exchange Center and postings in Q4 2021. That's where companies can go in and post needs, RFIs, RFQs that they have in the system and other manufacturers can respond to it. It's a prime indicator of connections being made in the Connects platform and we are leading the way in that. Uh, currently, there are over 30 open opportunities in the Connects platform in the Exchange Center. Some of those are from local companies, many are from national companies that and buyers that come through our national manufacturing extension center partnerships. Um, and some that are closing soon include PET plastic sheets. There's a metal fabrication opportunity for uh, forming metal alloy plates and then a company locally looking for a new zinc plater. Additionally, if there uh, is any information in the Exchange Center that you have questions about, you can reach out to me. Um, there is a, a post in there right now for an OCAST grant funding opportunity that actually closes in two days. So if you have any questions about that, reach out to OCAST directly or we can put you in touch, but it is um, their fiscal year 2022 intern partnership opportunity where they do provide grant funding to companies uh, through a competitive process who are hiring undergraduate or graduate interns 
to work on those innovative industry projects. So you can find information about that in Connects as well. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at connects at okalliance.com. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. All right, thank you, Michelle. Uh, with that, that concludes our list of speakers. Uh, Director Kissling, any closing remarks before we go? Well, I'm, I'm glad that Kenny brought up the uh, OIEP program. That's the Oklahoma Innovation Expansion Program. We call them internally our innovation grants. And uh, uh, the portal on that is probably going to open April 4th um, and will just be open for a few weeks. Um, if you want some more information on that, please let us know. Those are grants, as she said, to manufacturers. Normally, uh, Maximum grants around $150,000 for new innovative products, new re revenue streams. It's one of the best programs, I think, in the nation for us taking care of our own. And uh, it's a great partnership with the Manufacturing Alliance. So, Kenny, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And uh, um, just for everybody's uh, knowledge and information, Jennifer Springer is a huge Cincinnati Bengals fan. And so she is just elated. And I'm elated that I get to wear orange and black to my Super Bowl party. So everybody have a great <laughs> Great snow day and we'll see you later. All right, bye guys. See you next month.